Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start the very important part of this SAGES two, uh, 2012 meeting, the robotic surgery HOPO HYPE presidential debate. And I'm moderator Manabu Yamamoto from Tokyo, Japan. And the program described I'm a referee, so I wear it like this. And then this is co-moderator Professor Sadaba, uh, one of the very uh, one of the very pioneer in the robotic surgery, and also Professor Talamini. And those two people, those two professors, uh, hope group for the robotic surgery. And on the other hand, uh, Professor Scott Melvin, the president elect for the 2013 meeting in Baltimore. <laughs> And was, as well as Professor uh, <laughs> Nat Soper, and those two guys are hype. So, four excellent speakers will present you uh, the the future of robotic surgery and their hope of hype. And actually, I'm from Japan, and in Japan we only have the 38 Da Vinci in uh, in our country, and. We are very much beginner for the robotic surgery. And I don't know why I'm be the moderator for this great session, but I'm very flat. I'm very fair. I, I don't know much about robotic, robotic surgery compared to those four excellent people. But uh, probably I can uh, listen their talk, presentation, and I can, I also can, uh, I also can estimate and evaluate uh, robotic surgery in Japan will be a hope or hype. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you are the referee too. So think, think together. And uh, at the end of session, uh, I would like to ask you: robotic surgery is hope or hype? And also, this session is international webcast session. This is filmed uh, as, as a simultaneously broadcast to 30 countries for the mo nearly 1,600 people. So if you had question, please come, to the, come close to the microphone and all questions must be caught by the microphone. Thank you very much. So uh, we would like to open up the session. The first, <coughs> the HOPE site, uh, Professor Mark Taramini. Please, Mark. Well, good afternoon. I think you can already see why he's the referee, taking this very, very seriously. If I could get, okay, there's my first slide. So um, my job is to uh, talk about hope. Um, in terms of disclosures, my uh, only, I have no personal disclosures. From an institutional point of view, I'm the chair of a department that does receive some support, institutional support from Intuitive Surgical. And I would point out that I was actually assigned this topic to be in favor of robotics. So um, to the casual observer, it might seem like I have that conflict of interest, but obviously I'm supposed to be in favor of robotics for the purpose of this talk. So I just wanted uh, to make that clear. Um, oh, here's the advance. So um, again, as the hometown guy, I want to uh, express to you that I hope you're enjoying your time here in San Diego. The room attendance is a little bit light, and I suppose some folks might be out doing this, out in uh, Cabrillo uh, National Park, which is at the very point of the cliff that you see out the back of the convention center. This is down by the tide pools, my wife and uh, one of my sons enjoying some time there. So this is a little video clip that hopefully we can get to play. Is this mouse active, gentlemen? Doesn't look like it is. Oh, there we go. Okay, and hopefully we have the Google sound for this. Google is making the leap from search engines to car engines, but not for just any car. The new Google car is unlike anything else on the road because it drives itself. Becky Worley joins us via Skype, and you went along for a test drive, didn't you, Becky? I did. Good morning, Robin. Yeah, you, you heard that right. Google, the internet company, has been secretly working on a sophisticated combination of hardware and software that could revolutionize the feasibility of a self-driving car. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness for the first time on any screen a preview of things to come in your car of tomorrow. Ah, old visions of futuristic cars. First cruise control, then cars that park themselves, and then ones that helped you avoid fender benders. But now... Cruise. And now it's driving again. A self-driving car. And from, of all companies, Google. It uses cameras inside to spot traffic lights and other things. It also uses this thing on the top, which is a scanning laser. They say this car has already driven itself 140,000 miles. Driven itself? Really? Here's how it works. You tell the car your destination, it plots a route, it's aware of speed limits, traffic patterns, and known obstacles. So the wheel just turned completely by itself? Completely by itself. It's not intended to replace drivers, but to help them. It's like, you know, super cruise control. Imagine clicking the button for auto drive when you wanted to dial a phone number or read a text. If you wish to drive it, just fine. If you wish to waste 52 minutes in commute traffic, go ahead, be my guest. In fact, Google touts safety as their motivation. They say this technology could one day cut traffic deaths in half. Whoa! It got really nervous. Yeah, it must have thought it saw somebody coming in down the on-ramp. So how does it handle stop signs and alternating turns with other cars at intersections? Cross walk ahead. It would be the same probably with, with pedestrian safety in the sense of using the, uh, the, the radio signals to check and see who's in front of them, who's around. But how does it handle the unexpected? How about a little game of chicken? It stopped. But I... Well, that's enough of that. I, sh I show you that clip to, to demonstrate once again that there are amazing things happening in all sorts of fields of robotics. And that, to me, is amazing that that car has already driven 100,000 miles. And there was a law change in the state of Arizona to allow these vehicles to actually drive on the road. Uh, so uh, there's amazing things happening, and we don't want to miss out on the amazing technological advances that are occurring in robotics in the field of medicine and surgery. Uh, we know that NASA has taken great advantage of robotics. These are two examples of NASA using robots. And again, the idea is to use computer technology to enable human beings to do things that they either cannot do terribly effectively themselves or that are repetitive. And uh, these are all examples of this with the robotic arm in NASA in uh, outer space, humans simply cannot generate the forces necessary to do the things that astronauts need to do, so uh, robotics uh, take their place. So we're clearly on a journey from here to the, where we are now to the future. And on the left-hand side there, you can see um, the all-star operation from Johns Hopkins. That's a little video clip on the right that for some reason is not rolling. But what that is is a levitated uh, Pardon? Yeah, I can't get the. Oh, there we go. Um, that's a levitated uh, magnetic camera that can sit in the peritoneal cavity, influenced by a magnetic um, array outside of the, an animal's belly. So we're going from what Halstead did with one set of tools, one set of imaging, one way of doing things to adding technology into where we're going. And clearly, robotics and computer-assisted surgery needs to be a part of that. It needs to be a central part of that, and we're on that, that journey. If we simply rejected robotics outright, either at this stage or any other, we would never be able to see the amazing advances that have occurred in other fields uh, in the care of our patients. So, currently, what did we lose when we went from an open operation to a laparoscopic operation? Well, we lost three-dimensional vision. We lost some degrees of freedom. The, the spot from on the belly wall to the target tissue is fixed by a vector. You can't go around behind things. We lost some ergonomics. It's tough to sort of play twister when you're trying to do an operation on people for many hours. And we lost some haptics, the ability to feel the tissue directly as we do when the abdomen is open. Well, what have we gained back with our current systems of robotics? We've gained back that three-dimensional view. 
In fact, some might even say that what we have now in some systems is even more vivid than what you see in open surgery in the operating room. We've gained back those six degrees of freedom. We can go around behind uh, structures and tissue. We're not uh, limited by the vector point on the abdominal wall. And we've gained back ergonomics. We can put surgeons in a comfortable environment where they can operate for a much longer period of time, much more comfortably with much more, uh, much less price tag to, uh, to the surgeon themselves. Now, we still haven't gotten haptics back. Although uh, I have a hunch Dr. Satava might have a word or two on that uh, in his presentation. Um, but there are plenty of people working on getting that sense of touch back to the surgeon. And we're still in the early generations of robotics for surgery. There are things happening in laboratories that some of which some of us know and much of which none of us know that are going to continue to add back these capabilities and others to uh, what we can do in the operating room. Well, what about data? Data is very hard to come by because we're talking about fairly soft differences. It's tough to measure ergonomic advantages. It's tough to measure specifically the advantage of being able to see in three dimensions versus being able to see in two dimensions. So, uh, you know, I will quickly admit that there is not a lot out there in terms of data, although the first paper in our plenary session this morning uh, seem to add some concrete data in favor of robotics. Uh, but I will share with you this presentation. This is data that came from our outcomes group at UC San Diego. It was presented at the Western Surgical Association about two months ago. And in this particular study, we used the national inpatient sample to look at current national trends in robotic surgery. We wanted to look at mortality, length of stay, and total charges. And we wanted to compare open versus robotic and laparoscopic versus robotic. Now, as you all know, most of the robotic surgery being done today is not in the world of gastrointestinal surgery. It's in other specialties, and that's what this data reflects. But that certainly doesn't invalidate the findings uh, and the data that, uh, that I'm going to show you. The way we did that, this was using the National Inpatient Sample Database, which is a well-known database, it samples 20% of all U.S. community hospitals. And the reason we were able to do this is that as of October 2008, there, was, there were specific ICD-9 codes that were um, entered and used for robotic surgery. So our data set begins in October 2008 when that, um, those codes became active. And this looked at the data set through October 2008. So it's a fairly short data set. But again, the numbers are very large because this is a national inpatient uh, sample. We did adjust this data using well-validated methods for Charleston comorbidity index, age, race, gender, and teaching hospital status. And our specific outcomes that we looked at were mortality, length of stay, and total charges across a set of robotic uh, operations. So here's what the data shows. A clearly increasing trend from October 08 to December of 09 in prostate operations from 50 to the low 60 percentile. So that continues to be an increasingly, um, uh, the, the robot continues to be used in increasing numbers for robotic prostatectomy. And you can see these other uh, procedures are also gradually uh, increasing kidney operations, GYN operations. We also added uh, data in from knee replacement surgery because there is now an FDA approved robotic device for knee replacement surgery. Here is uh, some of the other outcomes data. Interestingly, when we looked at mortality for the entire cohort of procedures that we looked at, robotics procedures versus open procedures, in fact, the mortality was statistically significantly lower for, all, for the entire data set for robotic procedures versus open procedures. So again, that may not be a fair comparison for those of us who are already laparoscopic surgeons, but for those who have entered into robotic surgery not having done laparoscopy, this may suggest that they've enjoyed a mortality advantage. We didn't have enough numbers to compare uh, prostate mortality, robotic versus open, because the number of deaths following prostate surgery is way too low to be able to be analyzed. 
Now, robotic versus laparoscopic, as you can see, there were no statistically significant uh, differences. All of the green bars are below the one, suggesting perhaps a trend, but none of the error bars come close. And when you're dealing in numbers this large, that means that there really was no statistic significance here. Looking at uh, length of stay, the length of stay was significantly shorter, robotic versus open for kidney operations and cardiovascular operations. No real differences when we compared robotic uh, versus lap. And charges, no surprise here, the robotic operations were more expensive in both uh, cases. So from this first look at accurate national data, our conclusions were that although robotic surgery is currently more costly, it can result or may result in decreased lengths of stay, decreased odds of death, especially in procedures that were not previously performed laparoscopically. Now, if true, that would suggest that robotics is indeed an important enabling technology, although at a cost. So what about cost? Is robotics expensive? Yes. I mean, you know, let's face it. This is, this is impressive technology. It does not come for free. It costs money, like all of our advances. Uh, so is cardiopulmonary bypass, although we didn't ask questions about that in the 1960s when cardiopulmonary bypass uh, came into being. MRI and PET scanning is very expensive. You don't even get started on these procedures without investing millions of dollars. And how about radiation therapy? I don't know if anybody in your communities, people are talking about proton therapy, but the price tag for that is uh, almost unimaginable, and yet there are many communities that are jumping into that technology with both feet. And there are many other examples of very expensive technology outside of our operating rooms. Now, we are not accustomed to making major investments like this in our operating rooms. We are in our angio suites, our hybrid rooms, uh, where our invasive cardiology colleagues work. Those are very, very expensive technologies, um, but it's just that we're not used to making those investments in the operating room. Now, we're fortunate in an academic environment. This is a quote from our uh, CEO who's unfortunately left for greener pastures. He was not fired as a result of this quote. Um, he actually believes this both in this job uh, that he has now and when he was with us. As an academic medical center, we have multiple responsibilities, educating the next generation of physicians in a technologically advanced setting, advancing medicine through innovation, new treatments and technologies, and delivering state-of-the-art care, including access to clinical trials and promising new procedures. Fulfillment of these critical missions requires maintaining a state-of-the-art environment which comes at a cost. But ultimately, these investments lead to improvement in health care and in health for our society. So again, the point is we want to continue to drive innovation forward. Uh, it's very clear that we have to figure out the cost equation, but we don't want innovation to stop. Oops, went the wrong direction. So, robotic surgery, is it a hope? Absolutely. Our current systems are already delivering. We're still early in this revolution. There's a, an awful lot more to come. And the alternative is to assume that we aren't going to take advantage of this rapidly evolving world of robotics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Talabini. That was a wonderful presentation.